Good afternoon, everybody. Can you hear me at the back? Give me a wave if you can hear me at the back. Excellent. Hi, guys. Uh, so good afternoon. My name is Matt Woods. I'm the principal data scientist at Amazon Web Services, uh, which basically means that I get to talk to smart people, such as yourselves, about how to make uh, the right choices in terms of delivering uh, value from the data your applications are generating, and in terms of delivering high-performance applications on top of the Amazon Web Services platform. Um, so uh, I get to spend a lot of time with customers uh, discussing how best to use uh, the uh, Amazon Web Services platform for building all types of applications, uh, from high-performance scientific and technical computing applications all the way through to uh, more traditional web applications. And that's where I'm going to focus in on today. So let's just talk uh, a little bit about performance as it relates to web applications. Um, so I, it's kind of instinctive to developers to understand that performance has a positive effect on your, uh, on your customer experience. And this is not new information. So this is a study, a graph from a study that was published all the way back in 1981, uh, where people start to, to look at how the latency of a system affected customer satisfaction. And you can see there's a pretty obvious uh, negative correlation there, that the longer the computer return, uh, took to respond, and interestingly, this uh, response time is measured in seconds, uh, whereas we now tend to measure things in milliseconds, which shows just how far we've come. Uh, but there's a negative correlation between the time that the computer took to respond and the satisfaction or the happiness that customers experienced when they were working with that system. And that is very much carried through into today's uh, uh, internet scale world. Uh, this is uh, um, a result of the, uh, or the number of daily searches for customers uh, that had artificially introduced latency into their search results. Uh, so you can see when you start to introduce 50 milliseconds, it doesn't really make much of a difference. But when you're getting up to the 400 millisecond mark, so adding less than half a second in terms of the search results, uh, people will use your application less. People will search less in terms of the number of searches that they're doing. And you can even go to a more fine-grained uh, uh, measurement than that. You can look at not just the queries per visitor, but how people refine their queries, so do subsequent searches. You can look at the, number, the amount of revenue per visitor, uh, the number of clicks that they make inside your application, and the satisfaction that they have relating to that application. So all of these are negatively correlated. You can see this trending downwards uh, to, what's that, nearly 4.5% decrease in customer satisfaction uh, when you're introducing two seconds of latency into your application. So anything that we can do to improve the performance of our application uh, results in higher spend, or rather a reduction in the uh, cost of uh, the latency introduced. Looking at this the other way, Firefox did some interesting um, work <coughs> looking at the reduction in their page load time and relating that to the conversion rate, which for Firefox and Mozilla is a download of the Firefox browser. So they looked at a, uh, a simple web page. This is their download page, which had become very heavy. And they removed a bunch of cruft, and they took some, uh, took some of the approaches that we're going to talk about today, and they reduced the page load time by 2.2 seconds. And the result was 15.4% increase in the number of browsers that were downloaded. So again, reducing latency and increase in the desired outcome of your application, even for something as simple as a web page. And Fred Wilson, a well-known venture capitalist, um, says that when he goes through and makes a list, uh, of the top 10 things that his portfolio companies need to focus on, speed is number one. It is more than just a feature. It is the foundation, it's the uh, barrier, it's the, the, the starting price of delivering a high performance application and building a scalable, sophisticated business further down the line. So he says that uh, speed is more than a feature, and I tend to agree with him. So with that in mind, let's talk about a web request. Uh, so um, when we think about a web request, a web request is uh, relatively complex. It's got a collection of assets, and those assets are loaded from a remote server into a local client, typically a web browser. And what I have here is a uh, anonymized, uh, to protect the guilty, uh, set of assets over there on the left-hand side. And we're going to take a look at the, uh, the response time of those assets as we hit return on our browser. And this is pretty much what it looks like. So you can see here the, the top line there is the request for the home page. Uh, you can see a certain amount of time for the initial connection. This is the TCP handshake going through the web server. There's a certain amount of time for SSL negotiation, uh, sorting out all the certificates for a secure connection. Then you have a pause, this green barrier in that first line, uh, which is the time to the first byte. This is the server and the client sitting, waiting for each other to talk to each other with real content. And then after that, we have the blue barrier, which is the content download. So this is the HTML. And then we have all of the other assets that come in after that with separate requests. 
So this is the style sheets, the JavaScript, the images, and all the rest of it. And what you can see is that this kind of breaks down into two halves. Over here on the left-hand side, uh, we have basically the server being responsible for this latency, for this performance of the application. This is the connection, this is the latency of that connection, the handshake information, and then delivering that first byte back to the browser as quickly as possible. Over on the right-hand side, all of this is uh, on the, uh, the behalf of the client. So this is the browser. This is the browser taking that information in, and the browser will help you out wherever possible to make your application appear more responsive. So this is the very much the reason that when you, uh, when you click a link in a web page, the browser doesn't remove the page you're currently looking at whilst it loads the next one. Because if it did that, you'd be staring at a white page, and it actually decreases the satisfaction of the customer with the browser. So the browser leaves that page up so that things feel more responsive. So it'll do everything it can to help you out, but there's still a large amount of work on the client side to building the page and delivering the assets and rendering it and all the rest of it. Which is to say, um, for the majority of my talk, I'm going to concentrate on the remote side of the application. This is an area where your infrastructure can have an impact. But you shouldn't forget that there's a significant amount of work. In fact, the majority of the work is spent over on the right-hand side. Which is to say, don't listen to me. Just focus on your front-end uh, uh, optimization. And the reason for this is that when you look at the top 10 sites on the web, uh, you can see that the, res the, the, the responsibility of the response in terms of time is 24% in average on the back end and 76% on the front end. So optimizing the back end is a good start, uh, but you shouldn't ignore the fact that you've got some more work to do on the front end. So whilst I'm going to focus on the back end, because that's really where your infrastructure and the services that you use on AWS can really drive down that 24%, um, they'll, I'll touch on some, uh, some hints and tips for optimizing on the front end as well. And uh, just to show the sort of complexity that these things can get to, uh, this is the uh, waterfall graph, the asset load graph uh, for the front page of Amazon.com. And you can see that uh, it's relatively complicated, um, but that thin sliver on the left-hand side, that is the back-end component of the uh, responding application. That's the back-end component of Amazon.com. And when you can crunch that component all the way down to that very, very tiny sliver, it makes a much, much more uh, satisfied engagement uh, with your customers and as your companies grow. So let's talk a little bit about a web request. So web requests come in from your users all the way up there on the top. That represents your global uh, collection of users. It comes in over the internet. It comes from the browser when they hit return over the internet into uh, your application. Uh, it typically goes through a web server. Uh, this can be something like Apache or IIS. A web server routes your request through some application logic. Uh, this can be uh, some PHP code. This can be uh, some uh, Java stack. Could be Rails, anything like that. Application processes up all that logic, and it typically has to go back to the database, uh, make some queries, and the database will process those queries, go back to disk where necessary to restore the data, package that up in a response, it'll go back into the application logic. The application logic will extract the information it needs from that database query. It'll repackage itself, start to build up the HTML template from all the fragments and all the rest of it, deliver that back to the web server, which will uh, issue an HTTP response uh, back to your client. Which is to say that there are about seven areas within your application where latency can start to build up. And what I thought I'd do is just run through these seven areas uh, and try and zoom in on what we can do to reduce uh, the areas of latency, we reduce the latency from each of these steps within the application. So we should start at the start. So whilst I said all the way over on the left-hand side here that this is all on the back end, it's not strictly true. Um, about half of it in this example's case, and I did choose this example um, specifically for this reason, but about half of it is due to latency in the network. So before the uh, TCP interaction and the handshake protocol starts to take effect, there's this large gap all the way over on the left-hand side where nothing is happening. And this is internet-induced latency. And you can see that's what, uh, 30, 40, sorry, uh, 25, 30% of the entire request is made up of that latency. And there's a lot you can do uh, to reduce this latency uh, entirely and try and remove it entirely from your application. So it turns out that this Part of the problem of measuring this latency uh, is that it is not predictable. So it is not predictable for all of your users around the world. And you can't start to make a dent into the latency of your application until you are measuring uh, the latency in your application. So you should pretty much measure all of the things. But that is very difficult when that latency is uh, unpredictable or inconsistent. 
And so inconsistency plus latency is basically the, the worst case example. And this is particularly personified in this, front, in this uh, back end internet latency. Because you may have customers in uh, New York City that are talking to the US East uh, data centers. Um, but you might also have customers elsewhere around the world. So the London guys will have to go all the way across the internet uh, over to Virginia in US East to be able to get that data and then go all the way back. And that's a variable latency. That will differ from your customers in uh, Virginia, for example, or New York City, which are very closely physically located, or more importantly, network located with your, with your regions. So there's also, uh, you have, could have customers over in Sydney, which have it even worse. They have to go all the way through the internet, usually through Singapore, and then back over to the US uh, to get that to New York City. So you have a very variable TTFB, time to first byte, based on the geographic location of your customers. So this variability plus the latency is something we definitely want to reduce and remove because it makes it very, very difficult to measure and eradicate. So one way to approach this is to reduce the internet-induced latency by using a content delivery network. Uh, so uh, we just happen to have one of these uh, called Amazon CloudFront. Uh, it shares all of the same characteristics with the rest of our services in that it's available on demand. Uh, you only pay for what you use. And it's designed to deliver much lower latency on a geographic basis uh, with predictable, consistent latency for your application uh, consumers. In addition to that, it'll deliver faster downloads. So the way that it does this is basically by providing an edge cache network. Uh, so uh, let's say that we are a customer over in, uh, in Perth, and we have data stored in our Dublin data centers. Um, what CloudFront will do is it will basically take that request. For the first time that data is requested, it'll go off and fetch the data from Dublin. It'll then move it back and cache it locally in our Sydney data centers. After that first request, any subsequent requests from that customer or any other customer uh, will be retrieved from the edge location in Sydney. So that means you're getting much lower latency because every customer doesn't have to keep going back to Dublin and getting potentially the same information. So this is perfect if you have assets which don't change. So JavaScript files, CSS files, anything like that that doesn't change. You just want to be able to store that in a local edge cache. You're going to get much lower latency uh, and consistent latency for your customers around there. So that's the first thing. So that's a sort of typical uh, common use case for content, deliver content delivery networks. But with CloudFront, you can actually deliver both static and dynamic content. So you can cache dynamic pages in CloudFront, like search results. So rather than having to go back all the way through the request loop, all the way through the web server, the application tier, the database, all the way back up to deliver it over an inconsistent connection uh, to back to the browser, you can store the results of that database query in the terms of an HTTP, HTTP request in the CloudFront Edge network. So you can use query, stings, query strings or uh, cookies as cache keys. Uh, so these will be what the uh, CloudFront network uses to look up your cache within a local edge network. So you can use those query strings and the cookies to deliver dynamic content into your application. So this isn't just for static content. Irrespective of whether it's static or dynamic, uh, CloudFront has a ton of network and path optimizations built into it to accelerate even unique content. So even for unique content that's only going to be delivered once, there's still an advantage to putting CloudFront in front of your entire request, in addition to this dynamic and static content. So content delivery is a, really a, a first order um, service that you should consider using to reduce the latency, improve the satisfaction of your web applications. It's very, very easy to hook up. Uh, it works with uh, S3 objects, but also with any custom origin server. Uh, so you can just put it in front of uh, either your EC2 instances, your on-premises uh, data, or your data inside S3. So going down the stack, uh, we've reduced uh, as much as possible the latency introduced with the network by putting a content delivery network in front of it. Uh, let's take a look and zoom in on the web server and our application. Um, so what typically happens, uh, as you might request, is a request comes in, it goes through your web server, uh, HTTPD from Apache or IIS or whatever it happens to be. Your web server packages that up and then talks to your application server. Um, the trouble is that that can be uh, relatively high performance. Uh, it can deliver that very, very quickly when it's only getting a small number of requests because web servers aren't particularly well equipped to deal with um, uh, high levels of concurrency. So when you have a high level of traffic, uh, that's when you start building up a queue inside the web server. So requests start queuing up inside the web server, and they don't get processed by your application tier. They just queue up. Now you have a concurrency problem where each of those requests is going to wait until the web server can process it. Now, 
that may be only uh, you know, less than a millisecond for a low traffic site, but as you start to build up more, more and more and more and more customers, this concurrency problem can become pretty significant, and the wait times can start to impact the satisfaction of your web application. Now, you can run web servers with multiple processes, and that's fantastic, and you should do that. Uh, but it does impact how your application works. If you've got multiple threads of your web server working, uh, then you not to need to start to think about how thread safe your application tier is. And what happens to the application state as these concurrent application requests are being handled? How do you handle that state within uh, an application server? So multiple processing points is, is very, very useful. It will give you additional scale on a single uh, box or a single instance. Uh, but you do have to start thinking about how that will be handled inside your application. A slightly different approach um, would be to start to actually decouple your application and your, uh, your unit of scale. So rather than having everything bounded up into a single instance uh, where you've got low latency access to the database and all the rest of it, it actually makes more sense to, in terms of building for concurrency to figure out what your unit of scale is going to be and then horizontally scale that uh, unit to provide uh, additional capacity and reduce the concurrency load, reduce that concurrency-induced latency. And in the case of a web application, that unit of scale is typically the web server and an application server that is stateless and decoupled from the rest of the application tier. What I mean by decoupled is that each of these units shouldn't know too much about the rest of the application architecture. You should be able to add as many of these into your application as possible to add additional uh, 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 capacity and reduce, uh, add additional concurrency into your tier. And once you've done that and you've removed and dropped out the state back into the database where it belongs. It doesn't matter if these things start up and disappear as and when you need to add or remove capacity. The unit of scale becomes uh, very easy to add and remove to reduce the concurrency-based latency. And you can stick these things behind a load balancer. And what that then means is that as your uh, queries start to come in and you get more than your single web server can handle and you're starting to see increased latency in your application because of the concurrency, your load balancer will actually route those queries all at the same time to as many of these uh, different users, as, uh, as many of these different units of scale as possible. So your web server then is dealing with a much less, uh, much lower velocity collection of web requests. You're going to get lower levels of concurrency, lower levels of latency. So my biggest piece of advice for this is to decouple your service tiers. This is actually much, much uh, easier to develop against as well because you start to be able to separate the concerns within your web application. You might have multiple services, for example, under the hood, and you can then, once you've separated them out into units of scale, you can then scale those independently of one another. So it become much easier to separate your concerns, much easier to develop against, much easier to collaborate against to go across multiple uh, developers, and much easier to manage when you put them into production. And it also drives higher availability because these things are now fault tolerant. Uh, so these instances can be removed if they fail or come up when you need additional capacity, and uh, the application will just keep on trucking. So building for horizontal scale basically allows you to decrease your request contention and reduce your capacity planning headaches. So rather than having to be sure that you're choosing the run single instance type and, and vertically scaling that instance type by adding more memory or more CPU or whatever, um, this allows you to build for horizontal scale, which allows you to much more dynamically respond to the changing uh, capacity environment of your application. But it does require a stateless application architecture. So moving state from the application tier uh, into a, a decoupled environment, usually a database that is responsible for handling state. And pushing that down means that if these instances need to have additional, or you need to add additional instances of these units of scale, you can just go ahead and do so. Likewise, if something fails or you're scaling down, uh, then you don't lose the state of your application just because you lose uh, uh, capacity. So it does require that stateless application architecture. But the benefits in terms of availability and performance are, are vast. It also allows you to do small things loosely coupled. Uh, so this is kind of the, uh, the Unix philosophy, basically, of, allow, of having one thing and allowing that one thing to do it well. And it's very much the approach that we follow at Amazon. Internally at Amazon, we're a very service-oriented uh, company where each team basically owns the development of the service and the operations of that service moving forward. It allows each of these teams to be a lot more agile and focus in on the one thing that it does well. And you can see that in the services that we expose, like Amazon EC2 and S3 and Elastic Block Store. These are specifically designed to do one thing and do it well, and you get to piece them together, much like you would on the command line in Unix, where you can just pipe between them. Uh, with the building blocks that are exposed on the Amazon platform, you can piece those together in a way that makes sense for you. Um, 
Small piece of recommendation if you're uh, a Ruby developer, uh, of which I am, uh, you should take a look at uh, Unicorn and Rainbows. Uh, Unicorn and Rainbows are uh, custom designed for this approach of using the sort of Unix philosophy. Uh, they're Rack compatible, so if you have a uh, Ruby web application, take a look at Unicorn. Rainbows is like Unicorn, um, in that it, uh, but that it allows for longer polling processes. Uh, but these are well worth a look, uh, a little tip there if you're working with Rack applications. And you should also try and be asynchronous by default. And what I mean by that is respond uh, in an asynchronous way to requests. That doesn't mean in a high latency way, but where possible, use queues to decouple these things and uh, move state into those. So this allows you to basically reduce the response time of your application because you're able to handle concurrence, uh, concurrency. Um, however, as your application and your uh, users are using your application or not using it, depending on either the time of day, or say you're supporting a, a television program and you're anticipating to get a lot of customers very early on for that one hour that TV program is on and then they'll go away again, um, you do need to think about the response time of your units of scale. So how quickly those, response, uh, those units of scale can come online, become instantiated, and then start responding to requests. And you can limit the impact on performance through more rapid or low time uh, to providing additional capacity. So there's a couple of tips for that. Uh, what we're basically talking about is the time that it takes for the load balancer to notice that you have a, a significant capacity constraint, uh, instantiate those additional instances on EC2, uh, wait for those to warm up and for the OS to boot and the application to start up so that it can start requ uh, re receiving requests. The load balancer, uh, the elastic load balancer, will actually start to ping those applications uh, uh, with a health check. And once the applications pass that health check, only then will it start to route requests to them. So the time for all of that OS booting and the instance instantiation and all the rest of it can limit your response uh, if it's too slow. So how do we speed it up? Well, the first piece of advice is to use faster booting EBS-backed instances. Uh, these are the default, uh, but older uh, um, uh, armies, older Amazon machine images, uh, uh, do sometimes get stored in S3. That was the way we originally did it, and then we moved to EBS-backed instances. And it takes longer for S3 images or images stored in S3 to be copied from S3 onto EC2 and then instantiated. With EBS-backed instances, they're right there on EBS. We simply need to start up the EBS volume, attach it to the instance, and away we go. In addition to that, uh, Linux is faster to boot than Windows. Uh, we can provision a Linux server uh, in about 15 seconds. Um, but Windows takes a little bit longer because we have to shuttle security certificates around. Now, this is unlikely to determine uh, the choice of the platform that you're building against. Uh, but uh, it is a consideration when you're working with it. So EBS-backed instances will boot faster than S3-backed instances. And if you have an option, uh, you should use those where possible. Um, EBS-backed instances also tend to be smaller in size than S3 instances. So the, the instantiation time of the data is also less. We often see customers um, pre-baking their EBS-backed uh, Amazon machine images as well. So this is what Netflix do. Um, at the end of each code deployment uh, on the Netflix platform, uh, it goes through the usual uh, integration tests and unit tests and all the rest of it. And the end of that deployment pipeline is a fresh Amazon machine image. And that AMI becomes the unit of deployment. Uh, there is no bootstrapping on that instance or anything like that. It is specially prepared at check-in time to be deployed quickly. Uh, so the AMI becomes the unit of deployment. And this works well if you need to be able to scale quickly and scale uh, where the delta is very, very large, where you're bringing up hundreds of instances and taking down hundreds of instances at a time, where the time to bring those up uh, would be significant. So booting a new AMI, uh, which is completely packaged to boot quickly, uh, is, a lot more, uh, uh, is a lot more responsive than having an application which needs to bootstrap itself. So another approach which is very common with uh, using things like Opsworks or Amazon CloudFormation, all these sort of things, is that you basically take a vanilla uh, machine image, maybe li uh, Amazon Linux or Ubuntu or something like that, and then as it comes up, you install all the dependencies, you pull your application down from version control, then you start it up, and then you register it with a load balancer. Building everything into a prepackaged army is a lot quicker than taking that, but you do lose some flexibility and you have to put more machinery in place early on to be able to do that. So finding your comfort level between the two, entirely bootstrapped and entirely uh, cold start but prepackaged, uh, will uh, is an important consideration. You can also automate the response uh, with auto scaling. Uh, so 
one of the biggest uh, latency uh, components of adding and removing capacity if you're not automated is that somebody has to be actively checking the stats to see when you need to add and remove capacity. And that latency can be pretty high at 3 o'clock in the morning when everyone's in bed, and nobody wants to be on pager duty uh, as to, uh, to add and remove capacity at the sort of speed that you need to, to respond to changing capacity requests. Um, so we provide a service to help you automate this. It's called auto-scaling. Uh, we're not particularly inventive with our service names. Uh, and this basically allows you to set the operational thresholds of your application. So you can look at the amount of uh, network latency. You can, look at, you can look at the amount of network utilization for your current uh, group of uh, units of scale. And then as you start to move outside those oper operational thresholds, let's say you start to use too much, the, the total available memory on your cluster falls beneath the, the, the level where your application will start to swap. That's the point at which auto-scaling will respond and add additional capacity on your behalf. But it won't just go crazy and add like 10 million instances and you end up getting charged a million dollars at the end of the month. Um, you can set the limits of what is added either by the total number of instances or by the percentage change. So you might say between you know, 80 and 90% network utilization, add another 40% to my network capacity. So this is obviously much faster than a manual response, uh, especially early in the morning when everyone's in bed. Using OpsWorks, uh, you can also do time-based responses. Uh, so you can set not just operational levels of when to scale up and scale down, but you can set operational times. So you can say, well, my business application is primarily used uh, when it is uh, between 9 and 5 p.m. And outside of those times, I want to scale down to a bare bones unit uh, or do some uh, offline batch processing. So with OpsWorks, this makes it super easy. Uh, you can also do a follow the sun response to your application. So you can add and remove capacity to the various regions where people are working with your application and then scale back when those guys stop working with it, whether at whatever time frame uh, that becomes important. So time-based and follow the sun responses uh, can help uh, pre-warm your application. So in the half an hour before your application is, you know is going to become popular, you can start adding additional capacity at that point to the point where you are comfortable with the concurrency level. And you can also do preemptive scaling of some of the AWS services as well. So for example, the Elastic Load Balancer, uh, it's not exposed to you, but under the hood, that's a large distributed system. Uh, and if you know you're going to, you're, you anticipate you're going to get a large amount of traffic, uh, you should get in touch with your um, premium support guys and say, look, I know this is going to happen. Uh, and we're having, going to have a, an event, um, let's say there's a music festival. We know we're going to have a significant amount of live streaming. Uh, then please pre-scale uh, the Elastic Load Balancer on our behalf. The other approach is to use uh, reserve capacity. So whilst we try really, really hard to ensure that we have capacity available as and when you need it, uh, our data centers are not uh, infinitely sized, unfortunately. So there can be some times when you receive an insufficient capacity error. Uh, this is very, very, very uncommon, uh, but it can happen. And if you want to remove the risk of that happening when you're experiencing a, a large scale event, when you need to add significant amounts of scale, the best approach for that is to reserve the capacity you're going to need at a baseline using uh, reserved instances. These allow you to make a small upfront payment which will reserve that capacity for you as and when you need it. It's guaranteed to be available and be there. That means that when you start to reach the limits of your capacity and you want to add more, it's always guaranteed to be there for you. In addition to that, it also, because it allows us to plan uh, our operations more efficiently, if we know what you're going to need a year or three years down the line, we actually pass those savings back on to you in the form of a lower hourly rate. So it actually works out to be a lot more cost effective to reserve the capacity as well, plus you get that guaranteed availability. So that's the importance of horizontal scale. So you see we've moved from a monolithic, vertically scaled application into something which is a lot more responsive to our uh, changing capacity environment within our application. So let's take a look down and just take a look at the importance of choosing the right instance type. So um, as you probably know, EC2 has a wide range uh, of different instance types that are available to you. This is a collection of uh, mixtures of resources. So some instances have more memory. Some instances have more CPU available. Some have more or faster disk. So you get a full spectrum of price performance options and you guys get to choose what the right level is for your application. So choosing the right instance type is incredibly application specific. Your application may behave in a particular way or have a particular idiosyncrasy, uh, which makes a particular uh, instance type uh, a good fit or a bad fit. So my advice is to benchmark your application against a broader set of instances as possible to see what responses you can expect. 
And one way to look at that is to look at our CloudWatch metrics service, which will take a look at uh, uh, network utilization and CPU and memory and all the rest of it. So monitoring that change is relatively easy and lightweight. Uh, it's also important uh, that if you can, to select a 64-bit architecture as the platform, because that gives you much more freedom as you want to move between instance types and change and evaluate instance types. The other piece of advice is to relate those benchmarks, not just to CPU utilization, but to relate those as closely as possible to business metrics. So this is one of the components of uh, the sort of 21st century architectures, the next generation of architectures that cloud computing and programmable utility platforms allow you. You can start to relate not just the number of instances that you have back to the amount of CPU you're using, but also relate it back to the number of uh, uh, customers that you can serve or the number of images that you can process, all these sort of things. And so you can take a look at um, the price per operation for your architecture. And one approach to this is something called the canary in the coal mine. So if you standardize on 64-bit AMIs, you can deploy across the instance types, as I say. But it also allows you to evaluate new instance types with real traffic. So this is a demo that I ran at the uh, keynote of uh, reInvent, which is our user uh, and partner conference in Las Vegas. Anyone here at reInvent? OK, good. Um, so you might have seen this before, but this is the basic approach. Um, so this is uh, a, an application uh, which is running and processing images. And what we have here is a pretty static infrastructure. Uh, this, is, uh, this is actually a live application that we ran. It was running on top of DynamoDB, and we were throwing requests at it, and we were monitoring the cost of processing 1,000 images. You can imagine this might be an image sharing site. And you can, this is a pretty static uh, um, level. Uh, this is actually updating in real time. Uh, and then what we did was we said, well, let's see what the effect of adding a new type of instance is. So we moved from an M1 grade instance to a next generation M3 grade instance. What we did was we deployed the same machine image to the M3 instance, and we just added it to the load balancer. And immediately, you could see the effect of the cost of processing. These M3 instances were more efficient at processing the images, so the cost of delivering 1,000 processed images started to fall. And that was just with one instance that we added into the load balancer of the production traffic. And because that was successful, what we went ahead and did was we added another five of those instances into the infrastructure and removed the other five instances that were running on the old version. So you shouldn't become too attached to the servers that are running your application. You should consider them effectively fungible resources. These are resources that you can just swap out. Uh, we're moving from an area where, we can, uh, where it's nice to be able to sit and hug our servers, uh, but they don't hug you back. So don't become too attached to these guys. Just add and remove them as necessary. And you can actually have a significant impact just by swapping out the instance type on the cost of your operations. So the instance selection is important, benchmark and benchmark against business metrics. The fourth area is really uh, the interface with the data store. Uh, so it is always going to be faster to access that data store if you don't have to go back to disk. Uh, going to disk will always be slower than just looking something up in, in memory. And it's also got uh, an increased concurrency if you can look things up in memory, because on-premise, uh, on-instance uh, memory is much, much faster. So working with in-memory data is a lot faster than having to go back to disk. Plus, in most cases, you'll get increased concurrency because memory can handle uh, random access in a much more efficient way if you don't have to move the platter heads uh, across the, the read heads across the platters on your disk. So one approach to this is obviously caching. Uh, so you know, this is the, the process of storing query results in memory rather than having to go through the database layer to get back to the disk. But the writes still go back to disk. So we're just talking about reads here, which happen frequently. Um, we have a service for this as well, which can help you set it up. Uh, it's called, uh, uh, imaginatively, uh, Amazon Elastic Cache. And this basically allows you to deploy, operate, and scale in-memory caches. So this is memcached compliant. So if any of your uh, ORM layers already have a, 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 a memcached uh, component, then you can just point, spin up an Elastic Cache cluster and point your ORM layer at Elastic Cache. So caches are great not just for reducing uh, the uh, opportunity to go back to disk, but also for storing transient data. And it really should just be transient. So for example, web server state would be a good fit here. High score tables, anything like that. Uh, and any time consuming uh, reporting style analytics that you want to put together. And uh, particularly many to many query results where you might have to go across large number of uh, or do complex relational queries. 
You can just throw all of those results of those time-consuming queries into the cache and then go back to the cache memory to recover it rather than having to rerun the queries every time you want to do it. So in terms of best practices of deploying and operating a cache, uh, you should very much build your application and assume cold cache latency. This is data which is not cached uh, when you're building out your application architecture. So caching is an improvement to your application latency based on a cold, laten based on a cold baseline for your application. Uh, you also need to think carefully about uh, setting the appropriate time to live of the data inside your cache. This is how long the data is stored there. And it's oftenly said that there are uh, two uh, significant problems in computer science. First is uh, naming things, second is cache invalidation, and the third is off by one errors. And that very much is representative here. So choosing the right time to live of your, of your caching and doing the right level of invalidation is challenging, but it can give you significant performance gains. Um, it's also beneficial to batch requests rather than making single requests against the cache. Again, it's just more efficient to do those random accesses in memory. Uh, but you should always architect for cache failure. And this goes back to assuming a cold cache latency. Uh, there will be requests which go back to disk. You're not removing that entirely. The first time a request is made, and you should build the internal SLA of the latency inside your application, assuming that you're going to have to go back to disk or assuming that the cache has failed. So doing a cache miss and going back to disk is an important component of your architecture. It's always going to happen for a proportion of your users. And optimizing away from that means that those proportion of those users are going to have a worse experience than everyone else. So removing that, assuming cold cache, and assuming application cache failure, which ElastiCache helps you operate around, is important. So that's caching. Very easy, easy to add into your application for reads. Um, but eventually, some of those queries, as I say, are going to be a cache miss, and they're going to have to go back to the database. So what can we do here to help? How do we first uh, accelerate reads for our application? Well, the first way is that we get to choose between uh, vertical scaling, that's having a single database instance, and scaling that to add additional levels of uh, concurrency or query complexity, versus adding horizontal scale. So for horizontal scale, um, we just add additional database resources, just as we did with the unit of scale in our web tier. And this is perfect if you want to scale out read-heavy applications. Uh, so what you can do with uh, the Amazon uh, Relational Database Service, RDS, is add additional read replicas to your database. So you can have your master database and then spin up up to five additional uh, read replicas, which are purely based and purely there for read-heavy applications. So you can remove, you can move all of your reads going to the, all of your reads and your writes going to your master database and start to filter off those reads into the read replicas. Your writes still go to the master. And so obviously you've got additional capacity there to handle a higher number of uh, requests. Um, there's asynchronous mirroring of data between uh, the master and the read replicas, so you do have to uh, architect for that. Uh, but the, uh, the latency or the delay of that mirroring is available as a CloudWatch metric. So you can keep an eye on the, the, the replication lag between the data. You can also start to shard your data, and this is good for both reads and writes. So this is very useful if you have data which easily uh, comp compartmentalizes uh, either by geography or customer name or something like that. Rather than having 100% of your traffic go to a single database instance, you can basically spin up uh, five different database instances and put 20% of your customers on each of those database instances. So this is very useful. You could have all of your customers in Tokyo running on one database instance. You could have all of your customers in, uh, in the West Coast running on uh, another database instance. And you can sh obviously shard to be more and more segmented and add additional capacity that way. So that's a useful pattern for horizontal scale. Like I say, you can also add vertical scale into the, into the equation. So you can add and remove individual resources to your database uh, by adding additional CPU, additional memory to the instances, uh, and that'll do more, allow the database engine to do more heavy lifting for you in terms of caching those uh, inside the, the database memory as well. And you can add more CPU for uh, resource-intensive queries, for reporting and all those sort of things. Actually, read replicas are a very good fit for that as well. You can spin up a read replica and fire your reports uh, to your read replica rather than having to go to the production database, which may still be uh, being accessed by customers. But at some point, you may want to scale the, uh, the input-output operations of your database. Um, and the best way to do this on uh, AWS is to provision the throughput that your application is going to need. And what I mean by that is that based on your application requirements, you can actually provision consistent, predictable performance back to the disk um, based on what your application needs. So this I.O. Uh, is reserved, uh, so it'll be predictable and consistent. 
It's also designed to be available and elastic, so you can add and remove uh, I.O. as and when you need to. And this mechanism of provisioning the throughput, the I.O. throughput of your application, is available for EBS, RDS, and DynamoDB. So provision throughput is designed to be consistent. So you'll get consistent, predictable performance of your I.O. And this is important with relational databases, such as RDS with Oracle and MySQL and uh, SQL Server. Uh, it's very important for NoSQL-style data stores like DynamoDB. And whether you're running relational databases or NoSQL databases like Cassandra or Mongo on EC2, um, you often use the Elastic Block Store under the hood to store your persistent data. And their consistent performance back to EBS is very, very important. So with a relational database service, you can provision pretty high levels of uh, I.O. for your database. So we actually support up to 30,000 IOPS on RDS. Um, now, the database engines beneath that can actually handle a lower level of I.O. So you can expect to get about 12,500 uh, IOPS uh, on MySQL with provision throughput, about 25,000 IOPS on Oracle. That's because uh, MySQL's page size is double that of Oracle's, uh, so you get half the performance, and about 10,000 IOPS on uh, Microsoft SQL Server. But we still recommend that if you, you need this level of throughput, uh, you should provision up to the maximum level of 30,000 IOPS, because you get reduced latency access. You'll get reduced contention to that RDS. You'll see some performance gains uh, with, uh, with, uh, with 30,000, with higher than uh, theoretical maximum levels. And you also get to select and run on provision throughput uh, with instance types. So there are certain instance types inside the RDS catalog which are optimized to work with this provision throughput model. And the way that it works is that they basically have dedicated network access back to the network attached storage uh, of the persistent data store. So on an M1 large, you should expect to get about 500 megabits per second. And on M1 extra large, M2 extra large, and M2 quadruple extra large, you can expect to get about 1,000 megabits per second throughput dedicated to your storage. So understanding this, architecting your application, and taking advantage of provisions throughput with RDS is uh, a key indicator for enabling lower latency access. And more importantly, enabling that consistency that we talked about uh, early on. Provision throughput is also available with DynamoDB. Um, so you can expect consistent performance. With, with DynamoDB, we'll maintain that consistent performance for you, uh, irrespective of the amount of data stored within DynamoDB. Uh, you can expect single digit millisecond latencies, irrespective of the amount of data that's in DynamoDB. And we do that by having uh, SSDs under the hood. Uh, so all of your data on DynamoDB is actually stored on an SSD eventually. And we manage those SSDs and the capacity under the hood to give you consistent performance. You just tell DynamoDB how many IOPS you need. The important thing there is to build for a uniform workload, uh, which is basically a plug for my talk at 4.30 on DynamoDB. So that's the read capacity that you can scale on your application. And you can see here that we've again moved from this monolithic approach to starting to separate out our concerns and building in the throughput and the latency concerns that each individual component needs to deliver that high performance system. So that's read capacity. We should also take a look at just how you optimize for read and write capacity uh, or for persistent data on EBS. So if you're not familiar with uh, the Elastic Block Store, it allows you to spin up network-attached persistent storage. And that data is snapshotted to S3 for high durability availability. And you can snapshot it and uh, replicate it across regions to make it available to uh, other databases. Um, the standard classic EBS volumes are built for moderate or, burst or bursty workloads. So you can anticipate about 100 IOPS on a standard EBS instance, bursting to hundreds of IOPS for short amounts of time. And this, by the way, is another reason that using EBS-backed armies is important, because that, uh, that I.O. burst is available when you start to up that instance. So with an EBS-backed army, you'll see EBS start to uh, provide additional capacity for a short amount of time as your army is copied and spun up. So this is really good for your boot volumes of your applications and speeding up the availability of those. But there's a second flavor of EBS available, which is uh, a with a provisioned high throughput uh, uh, I.O. intensive workloads. So here you can expect around 2,000 IOPS per volume, and you can stripe your data across those multiple volumes for even higher levels of throughput. And uh, provision IOPS with EBS is designed with consistency in mind. So you can expect to, to deliver 10% of the performance, uh, within, sorry, 10% of the performance, 99.9% uh, .9 of the time. So this is a consistent application, uh, persistent level of I.O. that you can build your application against. 
Again, we have EBS optimized instances which have dedicated network access. So M1 large, M2 double extra large, M3 extra large, 500 megabit, M1 extra large, M2 quadruple extra large, M3 double extra large, C1 extra large. We really need to change our instance names so they're easier for me to say. Uh, 1,000 megabits per second if you're running on these EBS optimized instances. So again, consistent network, predictable network perfor performance, predictable latency, and lower latency for high I.O. applications. There are some instance types, uh, such as these ones, so uh, the CG1, our GPU instances, and our high performance instances, like uh, uh, Cluster Compute, uh, which has uh, Intel uh, Xeon E5 processors, uh, high storage, and uh, high memory instances. Um, which are not necessarily, they're not specifically EBS optimized, but they already run on a high performance 10 gigabit network. So you'll still see some advantages of EBS optimization and higher throughput back to the disk uh, in using these instance types, even though uh, they're not specifically designated as EBS optimized. We also have specifically designated high IO instances. Uh, so these are designed for high throughput database workload. So if you're running Cassandra, this is absolutely the, the perfect data uh, the, uh, instance type for you. So these are equipped with uh, dual one terabyte SSDs. And here you can expect about two uh, gigabytes per second for reads and about 1.1 gigabytes uh, per second for writes. So these are designed with very high IO uh, uh, requirements in mind. And building a cluster of these uh, gives you extremely large amounts of performance. There's no reason your Cassandra cluster couldn't deal with millions of requests per second built on these high IO instances. You're reducing the concurrency and reducing the seek times of the database using those SSDs. On these instance types, if you're using para virtualization, uh, you can expect around 120,000 IOPS uh, using 4K uh, random reads. And at 4K random writes, you can expect to be between 10 and 80,000 IOPS. So again, build your application with this in mind that you can get extremely high levels of random reads using para virtualization and SSDs. If you're running hardware virtualized instances, which includes Windows uh, and some of the other instance types, um, Although hardware virtualization gives you uh, a, a reduced uh, abstraction away from the CPU, that comes at the cost of an increased abstraction from the storage subsystem of the instances. So you expect slightly lower performance with these applications, 90,000 IOPS for reads and 9 to 75,000 IOPS uh, for writes. So you should build again that into your application. For um, high sequential I.O., uh, we have a high storage instance available for you. Um, this is specifically built with data warehousing tools in mind. So these come built for very large numbers of concurrent parallel queries. And for that reason, we have 24 two terabyte drives on the back end of these. So you can uh, scale out your application, scale out your query access across 24 spindles, and that gives you much higher levels of parallelization. And because of that, you can get 2.4 gigabytes per second of two megabyte uh, sequential reads, and 2.6 for sequential writes. So this is a very, very high performance system for the right type of workload. And this is what Amazon Redshift, our database warehousing uh, service, uses on the back end. We make it available on EC2 to anyone who wants to use it for anything else as well. So that's the block store. We talked about the read capacity. We talked about write capacity. We talked about using SSDs and highly parallel uh, data warehousing type workloads. Um, but coming back to our original uh, request, you can see that about half is on the back end, which is what we've been talking about, and the other half is on the front end. And so there's a huge amount of optimization left there to do. Uh, now, I am by no means a front end optimization expert, and so I can recommend uh, these two books, uh, High Performance Websites and Even Faster Websites, uh, available now on Amazon. Uh, so you can look these up, uh, available in Kindle uh, editions, uh, download them, read them on the plane home. Uh, really, really uh, excellent books. Um, extracting out from that, uh, there's about 14 rules uh, for faster loading websites. Um, so things like making fewer HTTP requests. These are things which make sense. Using a content delivery network is in there. And this is uh, advice from Steve Sounders, the author of those two books. So uh, some of these are entirely server-based, things like gzipping your components so they take up less over the wire, uh, minifying your JavaScript, that's a front-end optimization. But there are a number on here, like delivering through a content uh, delivery network, removing duplicate, duplicate scripts, uh, avoiding redirects, which you can handle at an infrastructure level. So all of this available at stevesanders.com. Uh, take a look at it, and this is basically what he writes about in his book. Uh, but he's really a pioneer in enabling uh, front-end optimization. Highly recommend you check it out. And so with that, we talked about uh, pretty much everything. Um, but there is just one more thing that I wanted to touch on. Uh, we talked about the full rev request within a particular region. Um, 
But again, that web request sits inside a particular region. And even with the content delivery network on the front end, you might want to scale across multiple regions. Now, this is very useful, again, for reducing the latency of your application back to your customers. And you can do this pretty easily. Uh, so we support now uh, Army multiple region copy. So you can just choose the, uh, the army that you want to copy across. So again, if you're using EBS-backed armies as your deployment of scale, moving those across multiple regions gives you the availability of spinning up the exact same application across those, uh, across those regions. So you can spin up the exact same application uh, with sharded data across these individual, uh, individual regions. And we do the same multi-region copy with uh, EBS snapshots as well. So if you have a database backup or you have uh, foundational uh, data, persistent data you want to make available, you can take that snapshot and do a multi-region copy across all of the regions that you want to run in. Uh, we have nine regions available, including GovCloud. And then you can hook all of those up to Route 53, our DNS service. Now, Route 53 has latency-based routing. So it will route your requests to the lowest latency region so you don't have to worry about that as well. So there's some advantage in uh, using not only Con uh, CloudFront for content delivery, but using the sister service, which uses the same endpoints and the same points of presence, Route 53, to distribute out your latency-based uh, requests across multiple regions. And that's very easy to do now that we've added multi-region uh, deployment options through AMI and snapshot copy. And with that, I'd like to thank you very much for your attention. Thanks. <laughs>